I would like to start with the story of a lighthouse, built a long time ago in 1849 on the coast of New Jersey. For these past two centuries, it has been saving lives, helping ships navigate safely to shore. Time has passed and things have changed. Now it is the lighthouse that needs to be saved. For the past few years, the local community has been organizing to protect and preserve this historical landmark. But what are they trying to protect it from? A rising global sea level has put the lighthouse at risk. During very high tides, water comes into the basement of the lighthouse, damaging the foundation. And the residents are afraid that this is just the beginning. Lighthouses across the world are facing increasing risks of damage. Some have been toppled already. And as the sea level rises and coastal storms become more intense, others will follow. We are of course talking about climate change, the greatest challenge of the 21st century. And the struggle to protect lighthouses is just a foreshadowing of the struggle to protect our families and communities. My name is Indranil Kasmarkar. I'm a researcher in the field of urban resilience to climate change. I grew up in Pune. I did my bachelor's in mathematics at UC Berkeley. I did my PhD at Stanford University, where I developed mathematical models to quantify the impacts of climate change on communities. Now, we all know that climate change is a grave and urgent problem. So I'm not here to tell you about the need to reduce carbon emissions and live sustainably. You all know that already. What I'd like to share with you is a broader perspective about where we are headed into the future. Over the past few decades, we have learned some sobering things about how our planet works. And we've realized that certain changes are not easily reversible. Here is the Antarctic ice sheet, a magnificent, massive physical system that is so big, it creates its own climate. As of now, we do not fully understand the physics of ice sheets, but we know that the Antarctic ice sheet is undergoing rapid ice loss as a result of climate change. On the map, you can see the Pine Island Glacier, one of the fastest retreating glaciers in Antarctica. Here is a zoom in picture of the Pine Island Glacier. And to give you a sense of the sizes we are talking about, I have also included a map of our favorite city Pune shown to scale. So keep in mind, this is how the glacier looked like in March 2000. This is what its size was back then. And in 20 years, this is how much the glacier has retreated. The worry here is that if the glacier retreats farther inland, it could bring warm ocean water with it and trigger the rapid collapse of the entire West Antarctic ice sheet. Such a collapse would cause more than three meters of sea level rise, which would make major cities like Mumbai and New York unrecognizable. What is even more disconcerting is that we could stop all the carbon emissions tomorrow, but that may not be enough to stop climate change. Ice sheets operate at fundamentally different timescales than human beings. 100 years is a lifetime for us, but it is just a blip for ice sheets. Rapid ice loss and retreat may happen within our lifetimes, but rebuilding the ice sheet and reducing the sea level may take the Earth tens of thousands of years. As of now, Scientists do not know if we are past the tipping point of ice sheet collapse, but if we are, we may already be on an essentially irreversible path of substantial sea level rise. What we need to realize is that climate change is here to stay, and we must find a way to live with it. Yes, we should absolutely try to reduce carbon emissions, conserve energy, and live sustainably. But we also need to do more than that. We must learn to adapt. The first step in adaptation is understanding who is affected by climate change. 
For a long time, it was assumed that sea level rise is only a problem for people who live on the coast. But recently, we've realized that things are not so simple. The story of the 21st century is the story of two forces colliding with each other, where climate change meets urbanization and population growth. Think about all the urban systems that our modern lives are built on. Transportation, communication, the electrical grid, hospitals. These are all systems that we take for granted. Climate change threatens to disrupt these systems and put our modern way of life at risk. Let us look at an example. This is the San Francisco Bay Area, my home for the past 10 years. It has a population of around 8 million people and it is home to Silicon Valley. You can see the bay in the middle, which is this large body of water connected to the Pacific Ocean. Land is scarce in the Bay Area, and so development over the past 50 years has pushed right up to the shoreline of the Bay. This dense development combined with a rising sea level has put the Bay Area at risk. The Bay Area has two major airports on the shoreline of the Bay. It has electrical substations and wastewater treatment plants near the shoreline as well. Some of the major traffic corridors and bridges that connect the whole Bay Area are very close to the shoreline. And major Silicon Valley companies like Facebook and Google also have buildings very close to the shoreline. All these buildings and infrastructural units which keep the Bay Area functioning are at risk of being flooded. And the rising sea level is only increasing these risks. Let us think about the flood impacts in a hypothetical scenario. And this could apply to any city, not just the Bay Area. Let us say that we have a relatively intense coastal flood scenario. The flood waters can damage buildings, disrupt road and air traffic, and cause the malfunctioning of the electrical system and wastewater plants. At this point itself, you can see that the impact of flooding is not just limited to the people who live on the shoreline. The impact is regional. It will affect all the people who rely on these urban systems. When airports, roads, and electrical grids are disrupted, that may affect distribution chains. People in the region may experience problems acquiring food and other essentials. Businesses will certainly be disrupted, putting jobs and livelihoods at risk. And we should not forget that coastal flooding is an emergency situation with risks to the health and safety of individuals. If the roads are flooded, then emergency responders may not be able to reach the people in need. Finally, when the government's attention is diverted to disaster management, long-term projects like Development and education are kept on hold, which has lingering consequences for the prosperity of the region. Moreover, natural disasters can cause havoc in global financial markets, putting your job and your savings at risk regardless of where you live in the world. The purpose of this thought experiment was to leave you with a message that our world is highly, highly interconnected. You might think that whatever happens far away from you will never affect you, but remember, a bat in Wuhan, China was the reason why you had to stay home for several months last year. Flooding may happen far away from you, but urbanization and globalization will bring those impacts to you. So the question is, what do we do about it? What do we do about the flooding that we know is going to affect us, either directly or indirectly? Let us take a step back. I want to take you to the Netherlands, which literally means low-lying country. Netherlands is no stranger to coastal flooding. Much of the country is below sea level. Nevertheless, 
the people of Netherlands have come up with some fantastic solutions. Cities in the Netherlands have redesigned their public spaces so that they can address their reality of flooding. This area shown here is a skating ring in the city of Rotterdam. When the day is nice, people come out to have fun in this beautiful space. In the event of a flood, however, this skating ring acts as a floodable space, reducing the risks to the nearby communities. This clever idea of a floodable public recreation space goes to show that climate change is not all about destruction and disruption. Climate change is an opportunity to reimagine our world, to redesign our cities so that we can make our communities more resilient. This is an opportunity to be creative, to combine the best ideas from different disciplines so that we can help our communities thrive. To showcase one such creative idea, I would like to take you to Vietnam. These are mangroves, coastal plants in Asia that provide natural shoreline protection. During storms or high tides, the mangroves break up big waves and reduce the extent of flooding. Vietnam has gone a step further and has started planting mangrove farms. Not only do the mangroves mitigate flooding, but they also provide fuel and other materials to local communities. Now, mangroves are not a complete substitute for traditional infrastructure like sea walls, but in the fight against global climate change, we need a broad toolbox to address the unique challenges of each community. So I recently came across this tweet, the world's first trillionaire will be made in climate change. I don't know if this is going to be true, but what I want to bring your attention to is that cli addressing climate change is not just a moral imperative. It is also a business opportunity. To illustrate this point, let's go to the city-state of Singapore. Singapore is a densely developed island with limited land for agriculture. More than 90% of its food is imported. You may recall, coastal flooding and sea level rise can put our transportation system at risk and disrupt global supply chains. Coastal flooding both around Singapore and beyond may put Singapore's food supply at risk. So looking into the future, Singapore has invested heavily in vertical farming. This is a new way of farming where you can optimize over the amount of water, sunlight, and nutrients needed to grow crops in a limited space. And because this system is so controlled, it does not need pesticides or herbicides. In a way, vertical farming is perfectly tailored to the needs of Singapore. Vertical farming is a potential business opportunity. Not only would it reduce hunger in communities, but it would also generate jobs and profits in the process. Now, it is not the goal of vertical farming to completely replace traditional farming. Instead, vertical farming will provide an alternative for food production, which will end up making our food supply chains more resilient to climatic disruption. So what can you do about climate change? If there is one thing I want you to take away from this talk, it is that climate change affects all of us in every sphere of life. And therefore, regardless of what field you are in, there is a role for you to play in the fight against climate change. Case in point, let us go to the San Francisco Bay Area to Stanford University. For the past four years, I have been part of the Stanford Future Bay Initiative, a unique program that combines research, education, and practice. Undergraduate and graduate students may enroll in this class on climate change, but instead of doing the usual class projects or homeworks, students connect with communities and government officials in the Bay Area to address local issues related to climate change. 
Students shape their own projects based on their strengths and backgrounds. Previous projects include assessing flood risk to vulnerable populations, analyzing flood-related traffic disruption, and studying flood insurance policies. The students present their findings during meetings like the one shown here to their community partners. These projects are a service to communities and the students get a meaningful and practical education in the process. My own work of modeling sea level rise impacts was shaped by the Stanford Future Bay Initiative. Climate change is a major challenge that we will face in our lifetimes. Our excessive carbon emissions are putting the earth out of balance and we need to get our act together and live more sustainably. At the same time, we need to understand that climate change is here to stay. Our actions have set in motion certain dynamics that may not be reversed very quickly. The Earth does not operate at the same time scale as we humans do. And it may take thousands of years to heal from the damage we have caused. And so we will have to live with climate change. And because our world has become more interconnected than ever, we are going to have to face the impacts of climate change regardless of where we live. Time is limited. The next few decades will be crucial in developing the strength and resilience that our communities will need to withstand climate change. But not all is dark. Climate change is an opportunity to bring out the best of us, to transform the way we live. I want you to take a moment to step back and think about what you like, what your passions are, and how climate change may fit into it. Because the truth is, scientists alone are not going to solve this problem. We need everyone. Thank you so much for listening to my talk. I really appreciate the opportunity that TED and MMCOE have provided to me and a shout out to the organizing team for doing a fantastic job. Thank you.